Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us for uh, the webinar uh, today. Uh, I think this is the fourth uh, webinar. We had Uma talking about biodiversity, uh, and then Sanjay talking about insects, and then we have had uh, Deepa talk about bacteria. And then last week we had uh, Jai Sri Ratnam talk up, take us through uh, the topic of acoustics in uh, uh, bats and uh, dolphins. And today we have Suhail who's going to talk about birds. Uh, so Suhail has had a long-term interest on birds, uh, I think ever since his teens. And uh, he's been very uh, fortunate to continue his interests and he's one of his broad interests. And he works in the Nature Conservation Foundation and uh, talking uh, about the uh, place, uh, his um, unit, uh, he's been doing many nice things. And one of them is to um, start off this sort of a database or which is called as an eBird. And um, this is a kind of uh, engaging bird watchers all through the country to participate and record the bird uh, sightings and so on. And uh, it's very nice to see that uh, the number of uh, in, in images, uh, we have more than they have uh, more than two million. That shows uh, how much he was able to capture the participation and get people involved. Uh, that's very nice. And uh, talking about Suhail, I must say one thing, uh, which is um, you know, as researchers, we all uh, try to engage uh, with others uh, who are not in the area to uh, convey our science. So that's a huge learning experience for us. Uh, but then for people uh, like Suhail and others in ecology, I think it becomes a public engagement becomes a mandate. Uh, so they, they do it uh, rather well, <laughs> to put it in small words. Uh, but for example, uh, I remember some years ago, uh, Suhail had talked to us in NCBS when he was a young investigator. At that time, he had talked to us about how the coils uh, 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 put their uh, eggs in the... Uh, crossness or something and and I remember we were all like we were hearing his talk like that and then it was followed by a huge number of questions so I'm sure uh, today also the talk will be as enthralling and uh, knowledge uh, giving uh, and so hail please thank you uh, thank you so much Solamani uh, can you hear me Yes, we can hear you. Yeah, thanks, Chandrakant. So thanks, Adamani. Thanks, Chandrakant. Thanks, Pavitra and uh, Bangalore Life Science uh, Cluster uh, for giving me this opportunity. I'm going to uh, see if I can share my screen. Uh, is that working? Yes. yes, it's working. Yeah, it's great. All right. Great. So thank you to all of you uh, for taking the time on your Sunday morning to, uh, to attend this. Um, I hope you're all healthy and safe. Um, when I was uh, thinking about what to speak about, uh, various uh, options ran through my mind. But uh, I thought uh, eventually that I would uh, see if I could take you on a bit of a personal journey of, uh, of my own. And as Salamni said, I started getting interested in birds in my uh, teens, early teens and uh, spent a lot of time outdoors looking for birds, uh, traveling to places. And I always knew that I wanted to do something related to birds uh, for, uh, for, my, for my life, for my career. And I've been really lucky to be able to combine uh, my passion for birds with a career in science. Um, and so I've been able to, ever since my teens, been able to constantly uh, be outdoors, look for birds and, uh, and find out more about them. So uh, I thought in this talk, I'll uh, take you through some of that journey and then all, all the way up to the, the present day, and then also give you some idea about how you, if you're interested, can, uh, can learn more about birds as well. So I'll start this, uh, this story in um, a beautiful place called Naina Devi in the foothills of the Himalayas. And uh, there's a major reservoir you can see in the background, and there's a reserve forest. And this is where I did uh, some of my master's uh, research. And I worked on this particular species, which is called, used to be called the gray tit. Now it's called Cinereus tit. Cinereus is just a fancy uh, word for gray. Um, and uh, the, this is a beautiful bird found all over the country. Uh, and this is a male. You can see it's got a nice black bib with a, a thick stripe down the belly. And this is a female, slightly thinner bib with a thin stripe down the belly. 
And with these birds, it was a short project, but uh, my goal was to try and understand how they use space, how they, in the winter time, how they forage and uh, uh, find food and uh, how far they go when they're doing this. Now, this is very hard to do unless you're able to, um, in some way, tag individual birds. So now you can recognize individuals. Um, so here is a picture of what we do. This is not a great tip. It's not my photo, but it shows you what, uh, how one can do this. One catches the birds using mist nets, doesn't harm them. And then you can put these uh, colored bands on them. And with the colored bands, you can give a unique co combination. And so out in the field, you can find the birds again, you can follow them, and you know exactly which bird you're following. So this is a really uh, low tech, but very simple uh, way to understand where birds go and how they use space and to look at differences between individuals and so on. So with this, just a little uh, 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 insight into some of the things that uh, I was able to do. So this is one particular bird, uh, great it, it's a, a male, uh, which I call light blue because of the color of his band. And uh, the two different colors here show uh, the male uh, in um, the red shows in January, and this is in January of uh, uh, 1995, so this is a long time ago. And the yellow dots show Jan uh, February of 1995. And so you can see that this male largely has a consistent home range, maybe a slight contraction of the range from January to February. So the yellow dots are slightly more clustered in the red. But I just wanted to show this to you to show how uh, uh, bird researchers in the field might try and collect this kind of information. And I won't say more about this particular project. There's, of course, a lot to say, but I want to move on to the next one, the next species in the next project, which is on a bird that many of you may know of. Uh, it's called the Baya weaver. And uh, weaver birds are wonderful. They, they build these fabulous nests. Most of them are colonial. That is, they build nests in a colony like this. And uh, weavers are also interesting uh, because in, uh, in these species, it's uh, the male who builds the nest rather than the female, or in most birds, it's either the female alone or the male and female together. So I want to show you a little bit about why this is so interesting by showing you a small video of a male weaving his nest. So I hope you can see this. So the male is perched on the nest he takes a strand of grass and then pushes it through uh, the fabric and then pulls it out. And you can see how it's making a stitch right through the front of the nest like this. Yeah, does that make sense? I hope you could see that. Um, so uh, males use all kinds of different weaves. So this is from some old work uh, done uh, on African weavers. And you can see various kinds of ways in which males take these long grass strands and make knots and stitches and weaves out of them. Here is a close-up of an old nest. Uh, this is part of the entrance tube of the nest. And if you look closely, you can see uh, it looks at first glance like a tangle of, of fibers, but actually it's extremely strong. And if a nest, you couldn't, with your bare hands, it wouldn't be possible for you to tear a nest apart because it's uh, made of strong material and it's uh, woven together so tightly. So as I said, the males build the nests and, uh, and then they display them to females. Now, uh, Baya uh, weaver bird males are very hardworking, but they don't want to work more than is uh, absolutely required. So they don't build a complete nest. They build this half-built nest, as you can see over here. It looks somewhat like a motorcycle helmet, so we call it a helmet nest. And at this stage, the females then come and perch on the chin strap of the helmet, and they inspect the nest. And if they like what they see, and if they like the male, then they settle down with that male, and it's then that the male completes the nest. So here you can see the male has closed one part of the nest. This is where the eggs will eventually come. And then you can see the... Um, uh, completed nest over here. This is the, where the eggs are, and this is the entrance tube over here. And this is again a half-built nest. So I studied these birds. This is uh, many years ago, 20, more than 20 years ago now, and uh, the nests are high up in trees, and you have to climb up with ladders. So here's me on a ladder uh, looking at a nest and looking at what's inside. 
Luckily, birds don't mind the intrusion. They fly away. And then as soon as you leave the, the nest and the colony, they come back. Uh, so this is uh, some adventures in climbing uh, up to nests to examine what's in them. And to look inside the nest, um, I used this uh, amazing thing. This is an ear scope. Uh, you may have had the ear doctor look in your ears like this, but this is a, a plastic uh, variety that's uh, used for pets. And I was able to uh, get one of these pet ear scopes. And you can push the uh, narrow tip of the scope into the nest, look at what's inside. There's a little light that shines and then take it out and everything's fine. Uh, the nest hasn't been damaged. There is danger to these nests. Uh, I hope you can see here, there's a snake, a rat snake, which is coming down from the tree, an acacia tree, babul tree. And then you can see its head is over here and it's exploring and trying to see whether it's able to get uh, down the nest uh, and up the entrance tube into the, uh, the main chamber of the nest to eat the eggs and the chicks. And snakes are sometimes successful at this, but uh, luckily not all the time. But in my study site, actually there was another danger uh, and you wouldn't expect it from this cute animal but uh, these were responsible for the uh, loss of many, many nests. So this is called a long-tailed tree mouse. And what would happen is that the, the, the mother mice would uh, make a hole with their teeth in the nest and then would make their own home. They would destroy the eggs or the chicks and they would uh, have their own babies in the nest. And of course, then the birds would have to go away. And actually, like with many birds, uh, the uh, failure, nest failure rate is very high with bio weavers. Only about 10% of nests that are, are built, which have eggs laid in them, actually survive long enough for the chicks to leave the nest. So that's, a, that's a quite a, a small fraction of uh, nests that are successful uh, to the end. There's another danger over here, and, um, this is, and that is the wind. So the birds breed during the monsoon. And I hope you can see here, the nests are suspended from the tips of the, the branches. And because the monsoon winds are so strong, uh, they get blown around a lot in the wind. And you can see how they get blown around. And um, it was quite interesting. Uh, people have observed that the nests tend to be built on the side of trees that are away from the wind rather than toward the wind. And I was able to do a small experiment with old nests and with artificial eggs to show that indeed, if you put nests on the wrong side, that is on the, on the side toward the wind, then the eggs are more likely to fall out then if you put the nests on the side that is protected from wind, that's on the, on the leeward side, away from the wind. Okay, so my next story is about birds that are called brood parasites. Brood parasites are birds that lay their eggs in the nests of other species. They don't build their own nests, but rather they parasitize the parental behavior of their host species. And here's an ex extreme example of a brood parasite. This is called the common cuckoo. And this is uh, called a dunnock. This, uh, this painting is from uh, England. And the dunnock is actually the parent. This is the adult bird. And this is the baby bird. So this is the parasite, the brood parasite, baby cuckoo, being fed by the host, which is the dunnock. Now, something like this is obviously very odd. If you look at this, it looks completely wrong, inverted. And of course, people have had a lot of interest in how is it that uh, brood parasites, you know, how do they fool their hosts and what's happening in the first place? So uh, we did a small project on this uh, in a lovely place called uh, Rishi Valley, a dry part of uh, Andhra Pradesh. And uh, the parasite that we studied was this one. And I'm sure all of you know this bird. It's called the coil. And it makes a sound. This is the female coil, which doesn't sing, but the male makes a sound all of you are familiar with, uh, especially in this season, the summer and monsoon season. And the coils parasitize the parental behavior of crows. So this is a house crow over here. Now, what's interesting here is that if you look at the eggs of the coil and the eggs of the crow, they're actually quite different. There's no way in which you or I would uh, confuse the two. So how is it that the crow uh, is, uh, allows the coil to lay its eggs in its nest and, and allows it to, the eggs to remain there? Similarly, here are the chicks. So this is a newly hatched crow chick, which is pink in color. And here's a newly hatched coil chick. Its skin is really dark. And you can very easily see the difference between the two. So this is another uh, puzzle. So our project looked at this and other kinds of puzzles. And I just want to tell you a little, a few fun things about, uh, about crows and coils. Now, firstly, the way that we, again, this involves <laughs> climbing trees like earlier. 
Uh, this is my field collaborator, Somnath, who is an expert in climbing trees, but nevertheless, he wears a helmet uh, just in case of uh, if anything going wrong. And so far, nothing has. Uh, so it's tough work to climb the trees and to look at the nests and so on. So let's see what it looks like inside the, a crow nest, uh, which has a coil in it. So here's a coil chick. By the way, I should say that uh, all these, uh, so this video has been taken using a small camera called a spy camera, which has been affixed up on the tree. So there's no person behind the camera. It's just a remote camera. And uh, in the nest is a single coil chick. And if you can hear, it's begging. It's making a sound and it's opening its beak and the crow parents are coming to feed it. And it's also fluttering its wings. So these are three signals that the uh, chick produces to make, to, to uh, stimulate the parents to feed it. Uh, the sound, the open beak and the fluttering of wings. And you can see how the two foster parents faithfully feed the coil even though it is in no way related to them at all. So they've just adopted the chick. Yeah, there's a tractor in the background and the other, this is in a village, there are other village sounds that you can hear as well. And this crow is a bit suspicious, looks at the camera, but it's used to the camera by now and it settles down uh, to keep the chick warm because the chick's feathers haven't grown fully yet. So a peek into the life of a crow family that's raising a coil chick. Now, one of the curious things was if the coil eggs are, are so different and we can tell them apart, why don't the crows tell them apart? Are they, maybe the crows see color differently, maybe they see things differently and maybe actually the, uh, the eggs are good enough to fool the crows. So to, to try and address this question, uh, my uh, colleague uh, Sumit Sinha uh, conducted this experiment where he created a set of artificial eggs and he painted them in different uh, colors uh, uh, to match crow or coil eggs. And just to illustrate to you how well he did this, uh, look here in this nest here. These three are actual real crow eggs. And this is the artificial egg that Sumit made and painted. And these two on the left and right are real coil eggs. And the one in the middle is the artificial coil egg that Sumit created. And he also made two eggs that are intermediate in their quality. So uh, crow eggs, uh, artificial crow eggs, artificial coil eggs, but also two eggs that are entirely different. One, an entirely black egg and another uh, egg with big uh, black spots, so polka dotted uh, egg. And the question is, if we put these eggs into crow nests, what do the crows do? Do they accept them as one of their own or do they throw them out indicating that they have uh, they've seen through the deception and uh, they are able to distinguish the eggs so they throw them out. So the first thing to make sure is whether they the birds accept the crow eggs that is the artificial eggs that are painted to look like crow eggs. So I'm going to show you some graph I apologize for this um, that shows the uh, proportion of uh, families crow families that accepted uh, eggs of different types. And the first one is very important. This is the control, which says uh, where we put in a crow looking egg, if the birds don't accept this uh, crow like egg, then we've made some kind of mistake. Either the bird can smell the artificial uh, the paint or the eggs are somehow wrong and none of the experiment can proceed. So when Sumit put uh, artificial crow eggs into crow nests, uh, 12 out of 13 families accepted those uh, eggs. And the 13th one, they had laid, the female had laid very odd looking crow eggs. So actually our artificial egg didn't match the existing eggs very well at all. So by and large, uh, these artificial eggs work. That is crows accept them as their own. What about these extremely different ones, the black and polka dotted ones? In most cases, the crows rejected those eggs. That is very few were accepted. Most of them were thrown out of the nest by the next day. So the real question now, the one we really care about is what happens when we put in eggs that are painted to look like coil eggs? Are they accepted at the similar rate as the crow eggs are, which would mean they, are, they mimic crow eggs very well, or are they rejected at the similar rate as the very un, um, unlike ones are, which means that crows see through them? The answer is somewhere in between. So a substantial fraction of coil eggs are accepted, not all, 
but nearly 65 or 70 percent of coil eggs are accepted. So this means that coil, coil eggs are not perf perfectly uh, mimetic. They don't mimic the crow's eggs perfectly, but they mimic them well enough that a substantial fraction get accepted in the nest. So this is a way in which uh, behavioral biologists out in the field uh, are able to ask uh, questions of birds and have the birds answer them through the behavior that they, they show, because we can't, they can't talk to us and answer us that way. So we have to get answers to our questions through their behavior. So I'm going to switch now to talk about, uh, you know, leave those research projects aside and switch to uh, talking about some of the common birds around us, just as an introduction uh, to the, the sorts of birds we may be able to see all around our houses and our homes, whether it's urban or rural India. And the reason for this is that, uh, you know, I've, I've spoken about actual research projects and I spent a lot of time in the field doing those. Um, and of course, now during, during lockdown and during COVID, uh, one can't go to the field. Uh, but nevertheless, there's a lot of very interesting birds and interesting behavior to watch uh, just around us. So let's familiarize ourselves first with the sorts of birds we have. This one is a kingfisher. Uh, I've neglected to write the name here. It's a white-throated kingfisher. Uh, it uh, is an unusual kingfisher. You might think that kingfishers eat fish, and most of them do, but this particular one doesn't eat fish. This particular one lives far away from water, deep in forests, and actually it eats things like lizards and snakes, and sometimes other birds. Uh, or some of you may remember a, a song we used to sing in school about the uh, uh, kookaburra. And the kookaburra, we've, we mispronounced the name a little bit. It's kookaburra. The kookaburra is an Australian bird which uh, has a laughing kind of song. And it's a forest kingfisher, just like the white-throated kingfisher over here. Uh, another one that may be familiar to you is the house sparrow. Uh, this has been in the news. Uh, it, uh, you know, uh, old timers will say there were, used to be lots of house sparrows around. They would nest in houses, hence the name. And uh, there's been a lot of concern about decline over the last uh, uh, 20, 30 years of these, these birds. But luckily they are not on the verge of extinction. Uh, as you might have read, they're actually still quite common in cities, uh, in villages at least, uh, if not in cities. And so if you're lucky enough and you live in a place uh, that's a little more rural, you're very likely to have seen uh, these birds. This is the male house sparrow. Uh, the coil I wanted to point out, you see this is a female. Again, we've seen an illustration of this and this is the male. The male is entirely black. Uh, with a red eye, and the male is the one that sings the coo sound song. Uh, and these are singing right at this moment. You will have, uh, you should be hearing coil singing around you uh, all the time in the last month or two. Some of my favorite uh, urban or common birds are minas. Uh, and if you look closely at these minas, look, look at the look at the hairstyle on this mina. Look at the look at how carefully he's combed his hair. You can see the furrows where the comb has gone through. And uh, here's a jungle miner, a related uh, bird. Look at the little tuft of feathers. Look how smart they look with their yellow beaks and yellow legs uh, and beautiful eyes and very, very immaculate feathers. I, I love these. They, they look like they've, they're dressed up going to a party or, or to give a formal talk <laughs> of the kind that I'm giving to you right now, although I'm not dressed up quite like them. So these are miners. You'll see them very commonly. Look around, uh, look carefully, and you might see both of these kinds of miners around you. Kites especially the one on the left, the black kite, uh, very common uh, in, in cities and in villages uh, around India. Uh, notice the shape of the tail, uh, which has a bit of a wedge uh, shape. Uh, this is a, a key feature of, of the black kite. And kites are amazing. They'll dive uh, between uh, you know, scooters and, and motorcycles and cars in the middle of a, a crowded city street, you know, looking to pick up maybe the carcass of a dead rat that's been run over by a car. Uh, you'll see them, they're, they're mostly scavengers, they eat all kinds of things. And on the right side, look how, look at this beautiful kite. Uh, it's called the Brahmini kite. Uh, it uh, is found not as commonly as the black kite, mostly around water, uh, along the coasts and along uh, large uh, rivers and lakes uh, across a lot of India. A lot of people call this bird the bald eagle because the uh, American bald eagle looks very similar to this. Uh, but we don't have the bald eagle in this country. If you see something that looks like a bald eagle, uh, you know it's the, it's the Brahmini kite. Uh, and, and please take a moment to, uh, to stand and observe this. It's so, such a beautiful bird. Uh, we have several kinds of bulbul. 
the word bulbul comes from the Hindi word for uh, this bird, and uh, the very common one is a red vented bulbul. Look over here, it has a slight crest, which is a slight tuft of, tuft of feathers on top of its head, and white on its, uh, in just above the tail, and red just below the tail. And here's its cousin, the red whiskered bulbul, also very common in some parts of India. And uh, look at its uh, crest of feathers, which is much more prominent. And it also has a red patch on the cheek. Mm. This bird is called Hindi Sipahi uh, because of the helmet-like crest of feathers it has. And you're surely going to have one or both of these birds uh, very near around you. They're all over the, the country. Um, and finally, a bird called the babbler. This is a jungle babbler. It's, um, uh, in Hindi, it's called Saat Bhai. And in English, we call it Seven Sisters. And don't ask me why it's called Bhai and Ben in two different languages. But uh, they're called seven because they live in groups. And these are extremely fascinating birds uh, because the groups are composed of uh, families. They're all related birds. And they're composed of a mother and a father and the uh, children of the previous breeding season who stay behind. They don't leave the parents like most birds do. They stay behind and help their parents raise the next set of children in the next breeding season. So their parents and their children will help. Uh, and this is, it's really fascinating. And as I say, they live in these groups and uh, you'll have one group over here and another group, a neighboring group. And sometimes these neighboring groups come together at the boundary of their territories and they have a big fight between them. And they're extremely loud and noisy when they have these fights. And if you're lucky, you you might observe a fight uh, between these two groups of, of babblers. So um, finally, I want to uh, say a little bit about uh, how you, if you're interested in birds, or this talk has made you a little more interested in birds, how you might uh, be able to go about uh, learning more about uh, the, the common birds around you. Um, Here's a piece of equipment that uh, bird watchers often use, a pair of binoculars, which can really help uh, when you are uh, learning about birds, but they're not essential because you can see a lot and, and uh, birds are, can allow you to come quite close enough to see them. Uh, uh, but birds also sing and they call. And a lot of bird watching is actually bird listening. So even if you don't, uh, not lucky enough to have a pair of binoculars, you can still do a lot of uh, birding uh, as it's called, by uh, just your bare eyes and uh, using your ears as well. So just to introduce you to some uh, resources on, uh, on how to get started learning about birds. Um, oh, I'm sorry, I've missed a complete bit. I have a bit to tell you about my neighborhood birds before we go to how you might learn about neighborhood birds. Okay, so here's a bit about my neighborhood birds. During uh, lockdown and otherwise as well, um, you might think that a bird researcher finds it very boring to be at home and not able to go out uh, into the field. But actually, around your home, like we've discussed, there are lots and lots of birds. So this is um, sort of a, like a satellite photo of my neighborhood where I live. And I want to tell you about a little uh, project that I've done uh, where I've kept a bird attendance register. So basically, every uh, day, every school day, when I take my uh, daughters to the school bus stop where they get picked up. I walk 200 meters from home to the bus stop. I drop them off there, wait for the bus, and then I walk back. Uh, and during that time, I just write down all the birds that I see, I see and hear. So I make an attendance register. In that 10 to 15 minutes of time, over the 200 meters, uh, which birds have I seen? And I've done this every school day for the last six or more years. And I want to tell you something interesting that I've learned from this. So six years of bird monitoring uh, in the locality that, I've, uh, that I stay in. And I've generated about a 1,000 of these lists uh, on a 1,000 days, covering the same uh, period of time, uh, around 8 in the morning, 200 meters, uh, between 10 and 20 minutes. And so let me tell you about some of the birds we've talked about already. I don't know if you can see this, it's a bit small. But remember the gray tit we talked about in the beginning, Cinereus tit. From 2014, which is on the left to today, which is 2020 or 2019, end of 2019 on the right, my number of sightings of this bird have stayed more or less constant. They fluctuate a little bit through the year, but they're more or less constant. So this bird is about stable. Its population is about stable in my locality. What about the coil? The coyote over here fluctuates a lot. This is over different seasons. It fluctuates because it calls in the summer and monsoon. 
in the winter it's largely silent. So in summer and monsoon, I see a lot of these birds and the winter and monsoon, I don't. But if you look over years, it fluctuates, but the population is pretty much stable. Now two other birds, the minas we talked about, common mina and jungle mina, again, some fluctuations, but stable over the years. Now let's contrast this with the bulbuls we spoke about. Here's the red whiskered bulbul. The red whiskered bulbul has gone up in its population over the last six years from 2014 to 2016. And by contrast, the red vented bulbul looks like it has declined in its population. Now it's actually quite unusual for me to see a red vented bulbul. When I do, I pause for a second and take a second look to make sure that it's, it's a red vented bulbul and not red whiskered. And finally, a bird that has completely disappeared is a babbler. It's not the same babbler I showed you. This is the yellow-billed babbler, which also lives in groups, also called sadbhai. And I used to see them a bit in 2014 and early 2015. And since then, they have got completely extinct in my locality. So these birds have completely disappeared from the place in which I live. So you can see that just making that attendance register, daily attendance register, um, where I've I'm doing it while I'm doing something else, which is taking my kids and watching birds with them. Uh, I can actually, I've learned a lot about the birds in my neighborhood. And here is uh, filling out the entire picture. So these are uh, all the various species uh, are that I've observed and I've color coded them. The blue ones show a strong increase. The light green ones show a possible increase over time. The green ones show a stable or fluctuating population. The light uh, orange brown ones show a possible decline and the brownish red ones show a decline and there are some birds that have completely declined uh, in my neighborhood. So a small little project that anybody can do uh, doesn't require any particular training apart from being able to identify birds and uh, just over time amazing information can be uh, generated even if for somebody like me uh, I might be disappointed that I don't spend as much time in the field as I was able to in the field that is away from cities, away from uh, you know, uh, people and in more natural habitats. Okay, so now we move to the section where uh, I uh, will briefly talk about how you can uh, learn more about birds and maybe uh, if you aren't able to identify the birds around you, you'll be able to do so up to a level where you can begin to make the sorts of attendance registers that I've been, I've been talking about. Um, and one uh, resource is my colleagues uh, run a program called Early Bird, uh, and you can get to it at early-bird.in. And there they create a variety of different resources for you uh, to get started learning about uh, birds. So there's a series of pocket guides. There are freely downloadable posters uh, that you can uh, download and print if you want, or you can order the, the, the print posters. There are also uh, interactive posters where you can click on them and you can learn more about bird and hear its sound and so on. So if you go to early-bird.in, you'll find lots of resources to get you started. Once you are familiar with the most common birds around you, uh, you might want to go to the next level. Um, and uh, there's always an app. And here's, a, I don't recommend necessarily starting with an app, but if you uh, prefer apps to books, then take a look at this app called Merlin. And uh, Merlin, uh, you can download this app for free and then install uh, what's called an India pack, which will then include uh, all the Indian species for you. Uh, there are packs for different parts of the world. And with Merlin, you can do a number of different things. You can just browse and see what are the birds near you that you're likely to see and familiarize yourself with the, uh, uh, you know, what the birds look like and what they sound like. Uh, if you see a bird that you want to identify, you can actually ask Merlin to help you. So Merlin will ask you a set of questions about the size and the color. Uh, of the bird and where uh, in the country you are and what date you saw the bird on. And then it'll give you a list of uh, possible answers uh, to which bird you saw. If you have a photo of the bird, you can upload it and Merlin will uh, try to automatically identify the bird for you. Uh, and in these different ways, you can uh, familiarize yourself better with uh, the birds around you and how to identify them, which is a first step to uh, investigating further, to look at their behavior in detail or to do the kinds of uh, attendance registers that I spoke about. If you are already a bird watcher, please consider contributing to what's called citizen science. Uh, we run a project called Bird Count uh, India, so at birdcount.in, which is an umbrella for a large number of groups and individuals across the country who are interested in documenting birds 
and do take a look at the bird count uh, india website uh, there's a lot that you can contribute your observations can contribute and uh, collectively we can learn a tremendous amount uh, about uh, our birds in india with the observations of bird watchers so do contribute to citizen science if you're able to if you're a intermediate to advanced bird watcher let's say um if you want to keep in touch and if you want to know uh, you know what's happening from month to month or week to week in bird watching and uh, uh be alerted when there's new material uh, online for you to learn about birds and so on please uh, you're welcome to join the flock uh, and you can fill out this form at tinyurl.com slash join dash flock so we are always looking to uh, connect with people who like birds want to learn more about them and if they do know about them uh, who can contribute to a better understanding of birds across the country so do consider you know filling out the form we'll send you an email from time to time won't flood your inbox uh, and uh, and let's keep in touch so with that i'll i close this and thanks again to uh, the bangalore life science cluster uh, and to all the individuals who made this possible and of course to all of you who are listening in thank you Thank you, Suhail. I think that was a very, very good introduction to, you know, some of the ways we can learn about birds as well as your work. And uh, we have a couple of questions, so maybe we can start with those while. Um, Pavitra, can you do the poll before? Yeah, yeah. So, sorry. So uh, we just wanted to kind of find out, you know, uh, who's been joining our outside in sessions mostly. So we have a quick poll. and uh, we'll start with the questions while you're all answering that so um i'm launching the poll yes okay and uh, coming back to the questions uh so hey someone is asking do territory uh, do birds have territories in urban spaces so can you expect birds to come to the same place again and again sort of like a you know regular haunt kind of thing Yes indeed they do uh, it it isn't dependent on urban versus rural uh, there are birds that are territorial and birds that aren't for example crows are not territorial uh, either in the breeding season or outside so they'll build multiple nests on the same tree and and they don't fight each other off um other birds uh, there's a bird which i didn't show you today called the magpie robin which is very territorial no matter where it is so the males sing and they fight other males uh, and they they keep other males away Uh, but they are only territorial in the breeding season not in the non breeding season so breeding season for magpie robin is summer and monsoon and then there are birds like the bayer weaver that i talked about that even though they nest on the same tree they are extremely territorial just around their nests so they have a very small territory maybe just 1 cubic meter just around their nests and they fight like crazy to uh, to keep other males out of those territories there are also migratory birds which you didn't talk about today which uh, come only in some seasons typically the winter in india and then they go back migratory birds uh, many migratory birds are very faithful to the particular site so they come back to exactly the same spot year after year after year uh, and they go back so they're traveling sometimes 2 3 5000 5, kilometers uh, every year twice but uh, some of them not all come back exactly the same spot so they're able to find the same location and navigate their way back so that is that um is that sort of a memory of space or something like that how do they do that can you talk a little bit about that sort of memory for birds yeah so the um they, they do seem to uh, imprint in a way that is that the the for example where birds are hatch and grow up the habitat around their nests when they are small they're very impressionable and so they learn that this habitat is something good it's something presumably there's some feedback physiological feedback that makes them feel happy when they see that kind of uh, that kind of habitat and they do appear to learn also the precise location now how they navigate back is uh, is fascinating and birds uh, some birds migrate in the day some birds migrate in the night uh, if they fly, flying birds seem to navigate uh, using the position of the sun they have an internal clock as well they also navigate using uh, landmarks like coastlines and rivers and mountain ranges and night uh, migrating birds navigate uh, using a combination of things but one very interesting one is that they seem to navigate using the north star so they because the north star is the only star in uh, the sky that's fixed in position and all other stars move birds appear to use that as a way to keep their keep their bearing 
just like you know sailors and other travelers in the past used to use that and this has been done understood through a series of very interesting and clever experiments where birds the captive birds have been uh, kept in uh, in a, a planetarium and uh, where uh, you can change the planetarium sky the artificial sky to rotate around a different star that means a different star now is fixed and the north star actually moves and when you do that the birds actually change the direction they prefer to fly imagining that fixed star to be the north star and above this uh, there is quite a bit of evidence that uh, some birds also use the earth's magnetic field to be able to navigate so uh, there's so much to understand there's so much that's hidden from our senses to understand with birds and other uh, wild creatures uh, there's a uh, many many lifetimes of of amazing and interesting investigation to be done yeah definitely i think we have a lot more to learn about this and that's something that's very clear from all of our sessions that you know we are just starting to discover a lot of these things um so rudra banerji has a question that they'd like to ask live rudra please go ahead rudra um okay i yeah rudra go ahead your hand is raised you're unmuted please ask your question okay uh, maybe we'll just move on uh, sakshi saini uh, please go ahead and ask your question hello sakshi I don't know. Maybe we're having some difficulties. Uh, let's just go back to the questions that have been asked here. Uh, so someone is asking about um, plastic materials being used in um, the nest. So is it good or bad for the birds, and also from the environmental point of view? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, you know, birds have been using uh, human-generated material for a long time. uh for example uh, not not just with plastics but um, uh, you know kites uh, black kites we talked about have been using a uh, wire in their nests uh you know this has been observed for decades now uh so birds will use whatever is available and i don't think any of these uh are harm the birds uh, in any way i've never at least i've never heard of them harming uh, the birds to us of course it looks uh, out of place but uh, from the birds perspective it's a good sturdy material it's is probably fine uh but of course it's a symptom of the increasing amount of uh, human generated and non degradable pollution in the environment okay i see so um coming to the next question um how do birds find uh, the right habitat is what i think this question means yeah that's a really interesting question different birds have different uh Uh, uh suitable habitats for themselves there are water birds that need to be around water there are birds of grasslands open areas uh, for which that is suitable there are forest species that can only live in where there's a high density of trees and and so on and then there are generalist birds that are able to survive uh, and thrive in a variety of these different habitats um and i think it's really to do uh, just going back to the earlier answer it's really to do with uh, they they learn what suitable uh from where they uh, grow up um and so if i grow up uh, in an open habitat then i uh, you know that seems like home to me and i i imagine there's been some work done on this not a huge amount of research but it does seem to be that birds in a sense uh, imprint on their habitat you, some of you may have heard the word imprinting in relation to parents birds imprint on what their parents look like and they therefore learn what members of their species look like and similarly it looks like birds imprint on their habitats as well okay that that's really interesting i mean to sort of memorize it that way i guess uh someone is asking specifically about uh, jungle babblers so uh it it's about whether you know if the uh, chicks from the previous season stay on won't it increase the pressure uh, with regard to resources on the group due to a large number of individuals or do they sort of um, move from one group to another like are they immigrating how does that kind of work 
can you mm. elaborate mm. so so the uh, what happens is that the chicks uh, hatch and then they grow up and they stay back with the parents and when uh, let's say one of these adult chicks one of the one of the grown up uh, chicks uh, you know after a year or two they start to investigate and see if there's some vacant habitat that they can occupy uh, so they keep looking for opportunities to leave the parental group and find their own uh, you know found their own territory and their own place uh, either next door or or further away Uh, so what they do is they emigrate out of the group nobody immigrates into the group uh, the groups only grow by the uh, the young ones hatching out and staying back now it's true that when there are more uh, uh, babblers there are more mouths to feed and therefore there's more pressure on resources on the other hand if you have more uh, birds you can actually defend a larger territory because there are more uh, beaks to fight with uh, so you know what i mean so uh, just a pair of jungle babblers probably wouldn't be able to defend a very large territory but a group of 15 of them by the way i should have said that even though they call sat bhai or seven sisters usually they're in groups of 12 to 15 up to 18 sometimes so a large group like that can actually defend a large territory therefore therefore lessening the pressure on resources as well but it's true that they can't stay too long because the parents at some point also kick them out because there's a the next batch of chicks that comes through in the next batch of chicks so the birds can't stay indefinitely the parents also gradually ease them out okay i see okay that's that's quite interesting i mean otherwise it would be kind of a constantly growing yeah. um family right yeah. so um someone is asking about uh, observing the feeding behavior of shorebirds how do you observe that okay that's a, a interesting question so shorebirds are birds that uh, uh, normally live and feed on the margins of water whether it's on the coast you know it's uh, the marine uh, uh, margin or whether it's fresh water they tend to have long legs so that they can wade in water and so on um and shorebirds uh, because uh, they are in very visible habitat very open habitat unlike forest birds uh one can actually find a good vantage point that's a little high and and open uh, uh with good visibility and what researchers do uh, typically when they're studying uh, shorebirds is they use a, a scope Uh, a, a telescope in in the wildlife and bird world we call them spotting scopes because they are built for watching wildlife or birds and so you mount a scope on a tripod you make yourself comfortable under a tree or under an umbrella or maybe in a hide a hide is especially built sort of uh, usually a canvas structure where you can be in and there's a slit through which you can uh, look through with your spotting scope so that it doesn't disturb the birds and with a spotting scope you can observe birds from a, a, a long distance because one of the concerns for researchers is that they should not be we should not be altering the behavior of the birds if the birds are changing their behavior because they're nervous if there's a person close by and they uh, are are being alert more often than they would be and feeding less then it defeats the purpose of the research we want to know what birds are doing in the natural condition so we want to be as far away as possible and so show birds are actually very nice to study because one can be far away and study them unlike for example forest birds where as soon as you move a little distance away some tree or branch comes in the way and it's very very difficult to observe them okay that's really interesting as another option i guess once people are out of mm -hmm. uh you know being at home uh so pranav sharma has a question um i'm going to allow him to talk uh yeah good morning everyone my question is that uh do different bird species cooperate in nest building or in fight or do they each fight for their own they basically do they form alliances yeah that's a really nice question um they do form alliances mostly alliances are again family alliances uh, like the babblers i was talking about there are others as well um where bee eaters uh, there are other few other birds where they they do form alliances we don't tend to see alliances in birds of unrelated individuals um and in these alliances uh, they are usually for the purpose of territory defense uh and for feeding the the young ones they are not really for building the nests uh usually it's the actual parents for example in babblers the the adult parents who build the nest not the not the young ones as far as i understand um and that's because uh if you're a bird the biggest 
a difficulty in, in breeding and in, in having babies is in feeding those babies. Building a nest is relatively uh, easy. Laying eggs actually, it turns out, is not very costly for the, the mother. Uh, and incubating the eggs is not very costly, but it's feeding the young ones that is very costly. I just want to draw a comparison with mammals. In mammals, it's very different because in mammals, what's, what's incubation in birds is gestation in mammals. So actually, uh, female mammals, it's extremely costly and the female mammals uh, you know, bear a lot of physiological costs in nourishing the growing fetus within themselves. So in mammals, a large part of the investment in reproduction is in just carrying the child by the female. But in birds, the biggest part of, uh, biggest investment is in feeding the young ones. And so that's where the help is needed largely. And that's probably why where we see this cooperation among birds, it's largely in family groups to cooperate in feeding the, the young ones. Great. Uh, Prana, does that answer your question? Uh, yes, but are there any cross species which uh, kind which make alliances? I see. Yeah, that's interesting. There is uh, the so uh, I don't know whether to call it an alliance, but uh, there there is this example of uh, what are called mixed species foraging groups, which are groups of uh, flocks of birds which are composed of multiple species, not just one species. And all these species move together, this is typically in the forest, so they move together through the forest in a coordinated manner. And it looks as though they're they are, uh, forming an alliance in some way, they're forming some kind of cooperative group. Uh, it's not entirely clear whether they are really cooperative, whether each species benefits from the presence of others, or whether some species benefit from the presence of, of others, but it ha doesn't happen vice versa. For example, there are some uh, babbler species that forage in flocks anyway, and while they're foraging in flocks, they disturb insects and insects fly up. And then there are other species that are a little higher up in the canopy, like drongos, which see those insects, and they take advantage of the fact those insects have now flown up and are now visible, and they fly down and, and eat them. So we see babblers and drongos foraging together. Now the question is, is it an alliance where they're both benefiting from each other? Or is it that the babblers are simply doing their thing and the drongos are benefiting from the babblers, but the babblers are not benefiting from the drongos? This is a topic of, of current research. It may be that the babblers are benefiting because the drongos look out for predators and give the alarm, uh, sound the alarm when they see predators and therefore the babblers benefit as well. But uh, it, there doesn't seem to be any hard and fast rule. There are different kinds of combinations and there are different sorts of costs and benefits for both parties. So that may have been something that you were thinking about. Okay. Great. Thank you, Suhail. Um, and uh, I'm going to raise a question that's been asked on YouTube, uh, which kind of refers to your research experience more. So behaviors or characteristics which were kind of surprising from birds, you know, which goes against uh, previous uh, literature or knowledge. Can you share some of those experiences for you, for you, I mean, from your research or your maybe like, you know, contemporaries of yours? Uh, behavior of birds that's sort of unexpected? Is that? Yeah, yeah. Sure of, yeah. yeah. Um, well, let to, I'm not sure whether this will answer the question, but let me give you a couple of examples of, of, of odd behavior, uh, behavior that we, we wouldn't normally expect, or that's maybe unusual. Uh, one um, uh, kind sort of unusual behavior is what we call a role reversal. So in birds, very often it's um, you know either a male and a female together, a defender territory and raise young together, uh, so they cooperate between each other. So that's called monogamy. Uh, or uh, we or sometimes have like in the bio system where the males build the nest and attract the female if he can. And then the male then leaves the female to do all the work. And then in the next door branch, we'll build another nest and try and bring in another female and then leave that female and do so again and again. So this is called polygamy. Uh, and polygamy in birds is not as common as in mammals, but it does exist. Um, so these are the broad uh, two types, there's monogamy and there's polygamy. But there is also the reverse of the kind of polygamy I spoke about, which is where a female actually defends the territory 
and within that territory has multiple shall we call them husbands multiple males within her territory so what are those males doing there so it turns out that females lay their eggs lay a clutch of eggs a female will lay a clutch of eggs for this male and then the male does all the care from then on so the male incubates the eggs uh, feeds them when they hatch takes care of them until they're independent so now the female since she's not taking care of the young one she goes off and finds another male and lays a clutch of eggs for him and he incubates and takes care of the one and can do that again and again and one of the species in which this happens um we find a couple of species we find in india one is called the painted snipe which is a water bird it's found near the margins reeds and margins of water um and uh, it's interesting also because when typically in birds when there's a difference in the plumage in the color of males and females it's usually the male that's brightly colored and the female that's dull but in painted snipe it's the opposite the ma- the males are dull colored because they have to sit on and hide the eggs in the nest and take care of the chicks and the females are the brightly colored ones and they are the ones that fight between each other uh, and and so on and there's another set of species called uh, jasanas which uh, are also called lily trotters they they uh, have long toes and they walk on the surface of the water on the on the lily pads on the lily leaves and the long toes are to to spread their weight so that they don't sink into the water and there again females are the uh, d- the dominant ones they they fight other females they get as many husbands as they can uh, to uh, lay eggs for them so that's an example i want that's a good example i think let's not explore further but you know with other examples but that's an example of a an unusual be- behavior that people used to don't know about but please understand that all things are present in nature they may be more or less common but all kinds of social arrangements exist thanks for the, those examples sohail uh, we have one more person who's raised their hand um, pranav go ahead hello Hi Pranav, yes. go ahead. Yeah, am I audible? Yes. Yeah, uh, I have one question re- uh, regarding uh, what Suhail sir told that population of uh, red whiskered bulbul has uh, increased while that of red vented bulbul has decreased. I mean, uh, I had a doubt since both of them are very similar with respect to feeding habit and uh, even uh, ha- the habitats. So, what was the reason behind uh, the differences in their uh, population? it's a very good question i don't have the answer to it i don't think uh, anybody knows um, uh, you know to answer a question like this one has to do fairly detailed and and uh, and specific research uh, i i know uh, in some parts of the country you know uh, the problem is that these birds also switch what they do in some parts of the country red vented bulbuls are more associated with gardens and red whiskers are more associated with forests in other parts of the country that's not true in the andaman islands uh where uh neither of these bulbuls was uh, the a native there and and people have introduced them red whiskered bulbuls have just increased like crazy in the andaman islands uh, where they where people brought them there so red whiskered bulbuls i don't know they seem to be in some way more adaptable uh, more flexible and therefore take advantage of of new conditions but that's just a hunch nobody has done the research so i don't know the answer to that and i wish that you or somebody else you know would investigate this it's a really fascinating question i have another question regarding this that uh, red vented and whiskered bulbul are very similar so same thing with large billed crow and uh, house crow so isn't is there a possibility of cross breeding between them and uh, genetic uh, impurity as it happens with uh, feral dogs with uh, wild dogs and uh, Uh, you know what happens uh, is that the genetic purity uh, reduces so similar thing happens even with the buffaloes so is is there any such observation in case of birds yeah so typically you 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 know hybridization does happen in in nature but typically if the species are too divergent genetically then uh, even if hybridization happens the hybrids are not viable you know the the okay. hybrid offspring don't survive and and don't reproduce so um as far as i can tell in in these two bulbuls as well as the two crows that you mentioned that they have split long enough ago that uh, a large amount of genetic difference has accumulated between them okay. such that they never hybridize right. but there are other uh, and with feral dogs of course feral dogs are very very closely related to uh, some of the 
uh, the wild cousin, wolves and so on. And uh, domestic buffaloes are extremely closely related to only very recently, last few thousand years, right. away from wild buffaloes. So there you do get hybrids. But you do also get hybridization between wild species of birds. It's not very well understood in India. Uh, but again, we expect hybridization to be uh, prevalent mostly between extremely closely related species that have split. Uh, and I, don't, I can't give you a threshold of how many thousand or 100,000 years, but would need to be more closely related than red vented and red whiskered. Yeah. Uh, is there any uh, role played by global warming and climate change in their uh, So maybe you can uh, email more questions that you might have to Sunil. Okay. Would that be yeah. okay? I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. Uh, so coming back to our many, many questions. Um, so someone is asking about uh, pigeons in urban areas, you know. Um, how are they sort of... Uh, how have they overtaken the urban uh, landscape, kind of? And is there a way to handle this? The hate towards pigeons? Is that the question that you're reading from? Uh, no, is it? It's oh, more no, of no. are they dominating the space I and see, harming see. other species ah, and okay, that okay. kind of thing. Um, so, pigeons, um, and we have some good evidence now, finally, pigeons have uh, their populations have exploded. They are extremely high. They more than doubled, uh, I think, their uh, population uh, in the last 20 years. Uh, and the causes for this are, are quite clear. The more high rise. So, so uh, the feral pigeons that we see around us, they're descended fr from wild uh, pigeons whose natural habitats is cliffs. And therefore, pigeons love high rise buildings. So the more high rise buildings we, we build, the more pigeons love it, uh, despite our attempts to keep them away with mesh and all kinds of other things. Uh, and the second thing, of course, that uh, pigeons love is food and, and people feed pigeons and sometimes people feed pigeons tremendously. I think, uh, you know, there are parks in Bangalore and in, in Mumbai at the gate, uh, uh, gateway to India there, you know, the tons and tons of grain are put to feed kid pigeons every month. So what's happening then through this feeding is that we are, um, as, as humans, we are bolstering their populations because we are providing both the habitat and the food. Um, the impact on this, uh, I, uh, there's lots of opinion on the impact, whether it's uh, neutral, that is, it doesn't have any impact, or whether it's negative. I don't think I've, uh, and this may be my ignorance, I've not seen any research that's looked into it very carefully. But people, the people definitely feel strongly about it. Some people feel strongly against pigeons and against feeding them and so on, and some people feel strongly for. Um, I think pigeons are part of our lives and will remain part of our lives. I do think it's probably a bit incautious to feed them tremendously. Um, and we do know that pigeons can transmit disease to, to humans, uh, uh, things like that. It's not very common, commonly done, but, uh, but they do. Uh, you know, on the other hand, pigeons also might form uh, good food for some of the sp species, the birds of prey that we might care about, like peregrine falcons, shaheen falcons that uh, exist in some of our cities. Uh, and uh, increasingly, I think people do see in their high rise uh, flats also these shaheen falcons. So in my mind, it's, a, it's an open question, although I have friends who are on both the extremes of the, the divide. Okay, uh, great. So uh, coming back to some more of the questions, uh, we'll just take a couple more of them if you're not too tired. No, that's fine, yeah, if you have time. Okay, great. Uh, so um, how, you know, some, a lot of people seem to be again asking about the um, crow and uh, coal chicks. So one thing we want to clarify is that it is coal chicks that are being placed in crow nests, right? Not the other way around. Yeah, so coal females lay their eggs in crow nests, yes. Yeah. Okay, and uh, so uh, some more questions are, you know, uh, about mimicry. So the relationship between the uh, model and mimic is evolutionarily stable and stuff like that. You want to answer that? Uh, yeah, and also um, another question about mimicry is what type of mimicry is the parasitic bird exhibiting? So is it a visual or chemical mimicry? I mean, it's, it seems to be visual. Uh, birds by and large are thought to have a relatively poor sense of smell. Uh, compared with mammals and some other uh, some other creatures, uh, that's not to say they have no sense of smell. And research in the last 10-20 years has shown that 
you know there is a you know, some birds have a good sense of smell but birds are largely visual creatures and the mimicry appears to be largely visual uh, and that's why we were able to put painted artificial eggs in the nests and they still accepted them as as the crow eggs uh, so it seems to be visual the thing about the model mimic and evolutionary stable uh, so the idea here is that actually hosts are at a bit of a disadvantage uh, because uh, what happens what is thought to happen is that a parasitic species that doesn't uh, build its nest it finds a host now in the beginning the first time that a, a new host species is being parasitized it is what we might call evolutionarily naive it never experienced parasitism so it just accepts anything in the nest and it raises it now if doing so imposes a large evolutionary cost on the host then we expect a natural selection to uh, promote the uh, evolution of uh, defense mechanisms by the host for example the ability to discriminate between eggs or chasing away the parasite before it comes to lay the eggs and so on so then we expect an evolution of these defense mechanisms and there are some uh, hosts for example that are highly discriminating between eggs unlike the crows which are somewhat discriminating but not very highly discriminating um and what that does once the host evolves discrimination that puts evolutionary pressure on the parasite to then come up with uh counter strategies until such point as the parasite then switches to a new host a new species that has never been parasitized parasitized before so in that sense the parasitic species is at an advantage because it can always be one step ahead of the host and once the host becomes too smart it can always switch to a new host potentially at least that's how the argument goes so it's not necessarily an evolutionarily stable uh outcome but rather it's a constantly evolving uh set of strategies Uh, in this particular system okay okay um uh, yeah i guess that answers both those questions um so some people are kind of curious i mean you've mentioned a lot of resources that they can use to be more active with their bird watching and learn about it and everything but uh someone is asking about um you know how they can uh record them in general so if from home so maybe we could just quickly answer that from your own experiences you mentioned a bird attendance register or something like that maybe someone could pick a particular time what would be your very basic advice yeah i mean that's that's uh, i mean assuming that uh, you know some of the birds around you and even if you don't know all of them that's fine you can start with the ones that you know and uh, uh, the simplest thing is in a in a in a notebook uh, you know just uh, write the names of the birds on the on a left hand column and then keep drawing columns for uh, you know every every day and you can either uh, you you could have a fixed time of the day if you want or you could do 10 or 15 minutes of looking for birds uh, at any particular time and then you just tick off the species that you saw in that column uh, that means in that particular day in that session and you might want to write from when to when the session was where you looked for birds and uh, did you walk around or were you you know standing in one place and things like that and instead of just ticking them off you could actually write how many you saw uh, instead of saying yes there was a there was a house crow you could say oh i saw eight house crows and you could write the number instead of ticking it off so this is the basic of a basics of a attendance register uh, bird watchers what they tend to do uh, uh, and i do as well is we uh, upload our observations to a platform called ebird and ebird is a is an online notebook an online bird notebook for you and uh, so for example all the uh, lists that i've bird lists that i've done uh, when taking my daughter to the school bus stop uh, i've uh, uploaded actually i use the ebird app but you can actually you can use the website as well and it's exactly the same instead of using a register and columns you uh, say okay i'm birding now uh, if you're using the app it gives you the date and time uh, immediately and then uh, you know automatically and then you just say i'm seeing this bird and as you keep uh, bird watching you just add the numbers or the names of the species and at the end you say i've i'm done and the app calculates the time that you've spent and the distance that you've traveled and so on uh that's uh, that's if you get a little more advanced i think you you know if you're beginning it would be nice to write things down in a notebook uh and do it for a little while that way and if you ever feel you're ready to move to the next step you know do uh, visit the birdcount.in uh website or uh, ebird.org/india and you can create an account and you can begin recording your birds okay great i think that's a good place to start for many people and um 
I I just want to ask one last question, which is tied to um conservation. You know, uh, people asking there are how do we help protect the common birds around us? Yes. Or how do we support them? Yes. Yes. So um, I'm guessing you mean birds other than the ones that uh, love, say, you know, uh, built up places and, you know, things like house crows and, and kites and pigeons uh, are doing fine. We don't have to do much. Yeah. Uh, um, but it's the other birds who that rely, that are more, you know, uh, forest or garden birds and so on. So, sorry, Pavita, are you going to say something? No, no, sorry. Yeah, uh, someone has mentioned the black drongo and... Um, yeah. Other people have mentioned a few other examples, so that's what I meant. Yes, yes. So what birds need is they need habitat. They need habitat uh, to find food, and they need habitat to build their nests. And of course, they need safety from us. So if we are going around shooting or birds or or killing them with catapults, then that doesn't work. But assuming that doesn't happen, we need the habitat. And so, uh, in cities, gardens are very important, public parks are very important, and campuses are very important. And with respect to public parks, I do want to say something that, you know, very often there's a trend now for public parks to be very manicured, to have a lovely lawn, to have flower beds and all the shrubbery and all that to be, uh, you know, taken away, the wildness. And birds love wildness. So whether it's in your small patch of garden or whether it's in a park or a campus, to have a space where vegetation just grows without necessarily us always going and fiddling with it, I think that's one big thing. Um, in particular, insect-eating birds tend to be uh, appear to be in a lot of trouble, perhaps more than fruit-eating birds. So, uh, and that's because, of course, we uh, we plant uh, a lot of exotic trees that may not have the kinds of insects uh, normally uh, that we. So, most of our urban trees are are trees that are not uh, native to India. So, we need to think about planting native trees and native shrubs. And the other thing that affects insects, of course, is uh, pesticides and insecticides. And uh, as, uh, as people, especially as we become increasingly urbanized, we are becoming increasingly intolerant of insects, even when they're not harming us at all, like moths and things like that. And uh, so we get, uh, you know, we may use insecticides in our homes and gardens and the municipal corporations may use insecticides. And of course, in agriculture, people use insecticides a lot. And insecticide use has been linked to the decline of insects wild insects, not the target insects, not the pests only, but other insects like bees and butterflies, world over use, excessive insecticide use has been linked to declines there. And naturally when insects are going to decline, the creatures that depend on insects for food are going to decline. So I think we need to be aware of these things. We need to advocate for more green spaces. We need to advocate for more wild spaces. We need to advocate for less pesticide and insecticide use. And in city planning, we need to advocate for not uh, building such that there is no green space at all. And when there is green spaces to reiterate, to have it a bit wild. And this is very difficult because everybody loves greenery, but they love very manicured greenery. And that's not good for any biodiversity at all. Um, thanks so much, Suhail. Um, so I think uh, we'll wrap up here. And uh, Sudhamni or Mahin, would you like to make some comments? Yeah, yeah, I actually do want to make a comment. Uh, hi, I'm sorry, I've had really choppy connectivity today. Um, we have a, co a comment from uh, somebody called uh, Becky uh, on Facebook. And so Hill, she's, um, she's really very grateful uh, for the talk, but um, she feels very disappointed that you did not take her question. So do you think maybe we can just take Becky's question if it's yes. still up here? Absolutely. Um... Well, I don't see a Becky here. Oh, there, there is one Becky in the uh, question on the panelists. It says, especially the research on bio weavers and Asian culture. It's more like a comment. So Mani, maybe you could read it out. You can just read it out, maybe, please. Oh, it is more like a comment, Dr. Suhail. Very interesting talk, especially the research on bio weavers and Asian coils versus crows. Uh, perhaps on YouTube, uh, she has put up a question. Um, I don't think so. Uh, yeah, I, I, no, I think that was just a comment. Um, anyway. Uh, so maybe, uh, so here we had another, sorry, I had misread one question that was there. Um, the question was, uh, how come the coal chick doesn't evict the host uh, 
crows chicks as well you know doesn't kick that out of the nest kind of yeah that's a really good question um among there are about 100 uh, bird species that are uh, parasitic in this way they call brood parasites uh, and about half of them uh, are evictors that is that the uh, the chicks when they hatch out and they tend to hatch out early before the host chicks hatch out so when the parasite chicks hatch out hatches out in the evictors even though they are blind and without feathers they uh, have an instinct where if they feel anything else in the nest with them that they will leverage them onto their back and then throw them out of the nest and this happens with the common cuckoo that i showed and with a you know 50% of the the parasites the coil is among the other 50% which don't do that and um, and why they don't do that isn't entirely clear for the coils it might well be that the crow chicks are simply too big so an adult coil is about half the body weight of a an adult crow uh, and so and in the other species which do evict usually the parasite is bigger than the host and so actually uh, it's not so much of a uh, it's not so difficult for the chick even though it's blind and naked uh, to throw out the other eggs but in the coil it's the opposite uh, way around uh, so uh, you know that's one possibility the other possibility is that the coil chicks you know the reason to throw out the eggs is so that you don't have any competition with you that is all the food that is brought to uh, to the nest you can consume but there's a flip side to it the flip side is if you are the only one chick in the nest parents are just their feeding according to what they see so if there's only one chick in the nest then they bring less food and if there's four chicks in the nest they bring more food so what the coils might be doing and this needs to be investigated is that they are using the crow chicks i don't mean intentionally using but this is an evolutionary argument that the having the crow chicks with the coil is actually an advantage because the parents bring more food and it can be an advantage if the coil chick is able to get more than its fair share of food maybe through a combination of the call it gives and the the open mouth display and so on and that's what's thought to uh, give rise to two the, these two different evolutionary strategies one where uh, you are alone but you get all the food and the other is where you, the other chicks remain but you are able to get the majority of the food both of those may be good ways of making a living living for parasite chicks okay uh great i mean i guess that makes a lot of sense in some ways so um thank you so much sohail and uh, i think we'll wrap up here um we have a talk uh, next uh, sunday as well and that will be at uh, 9:30 am so please join us then uh, so damni would you like to add anything Yes. Um, yeah. Thanks so much, uh, Suhi, for this uh, very interesting talk and discussion. So it was equally spaced. Uh, I like that because you know, he had forty minutes to present and forty minutes to take questions. That is splendid. And um, also, um, I would uh, like to. I, I was particularly happy to see the seabird, which is more like a spatio-temporal manner of uh, recognizing the bird movements, and especially if some are likely to get endangered. Uh, it becomes an early uh, signal, uh, early warning, uh, as it were, to and try and preserve them. And uh, nicely uh, that the discussions were also uh, centered around that. Uh, with this, I would like to thank Suhail once again from the uh, from the panelists' uh, side. And uh, like Pavitra mentioned, next week we meet at nine thirty instead of eleven a.m. See you next week. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you to you all. Thank you. I'm closing the call.